Uh, with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, who actually was present at the first Skepticon, and um, he hates crackers. He likes squids. What else? About? He has an awesome beard. Guess who it is? PZ. It's PZ Myers. Give it up for PZ. Well, hello, everybody. So I have to ask a question. How many of you, this is your first time at Skepticon? Whoa, OK. My mic's not on, but you heard me anyway. OK. You have teacher voice. Everyone hears me fine? I hear, I hear. She's just neurotic. Never mind. Ignore her. OK, well, anyway, I'm going to tell you, you're, you're off to a good start here. This is a great convention. I go to many of them. And Skepticon has always been one of my favorites, just because this is the one where we all mingle with you people. <laughs> and we have a good time. And somebody's always, uh, somebody's always throwing alcoholic drinks into my hand, you know, so I can't complain. It's like you're my friends or my enablers. I don't know. Now, I, I do want to say, though, that you know, there's a fantastic bunch of stuff coming up tonight. And I notice, I notice the way the schedule is planned. And I think it's a sly dig at me. Because later this evening at the top, we've got Shelly Seagal, who is sublime. And you all know this, correct? And David Fitzgerald is going to talk about sex, sex, sex. Rebecca Watson's going to talk about humor and comedy. And here I am at the bottom of the list. I was supposed to get you started with science. Oh. I was going to apologize, but you make it sound like it's all downhill after this, right? Yes, tell Rebecca that. OK, so what do I want to talk about? Well, I want to talk about I picked an easy topic, one of my favorite topics. It's evolution, but in particular, it's this thing, the evolution during the Cambrian, the Cambrian explosion, as you may have heard of it. And one reason I enjoy it so much is it's like this great big trap full of nonsense to grab creationists. Because the creationists also love it. They think that here's this event that scientists have described, which is the so-called sudden origin of animal life 540 million years ago, and they think, therefore, they have been vindicated when it's exactly the opposite. It's not that at all. So you'll see a lot of stuff on creationist sites about the Cambrian explosion, and they make up all this stuff about it. In particular, you may know that this year, I think it was, yeah, it was this year, a brand new book came out from the Discovery Institute all about Darwin's doubt, it's called, and it's supposedly about the Cambrian explosion. And I have read it, of course, and it's an amazing pile of shit. <laughs> so I'll be saying a few things about that tonight. Uh, but first, I want to show you something, an exclusive. I, I actually stole this from the Discovery Institute. I hope you don't mind. You know, the Discovery Institute loves to put out these, these videos to teach people about their perspective on evolution, which usually gets it all wrong. And this is one on the Cambrian explosion. And I've got a pre-release copy. You'll have to watch this. It's, it's very rough. There are a few problems with the titles. There seems to be some internal argument about the titling of this video. Uh, but you'll just have to watch it and see what, what's going on. So it's, this is a real simulation of the Cambrian explosion as seen by creationists. And is it going to do anything for me? Oh, uh-oh. Do something. You mean after I warmed you up with that, it's going to die on me? Hello? Is it doing anything? Interpretive dance. Oh, there we go. Okay, there. There's our titles. That's Earth, 541 million years ago. Or 
4004 BC. There's a little debate about this, so they've settled on a compromise. And what this is is showing the moment of intelligent design. There's intelligent design, or possibly Jesus' holy seed, which we're going to just sort of call information for now. Information is a lovely pseudonym for those guys. And there, see, Cambrian explosion. And the only time in my life I'll ever use that horrible boogie lights transition. And there's life sweeping around the dead planet and all kinds of magic happen. Some of you may be looking at this and thinking, oh, this looks vaguely familiar. <laughs> I've seen this somewhere before. You all remember? But that's OK, because the Discovery Institute always liberally liberates their videos from other sources, more respected, more authentic, more honest sources than the Discovery Institute. But there we are. There we go. We've got, we've got the whole planet just boom, splash. There we are. We are now full of all kinds of cool stuff. This is the unspoken view of many creationists that the way this whole thing works is by, by means of some instantaneous transformation. As I mentioned, uh, one of the guys who's been pushing this story lately is this fellow, Stephen Meyer of the Discovery Institute. There's his brand new book. If you really have lots of money to burn, go ahead, get yourself a copy. Um, I'm, I'm a fervent endorser of the idea that you should always know your enemy. So go ahead and take a look at it. Just be prepared. It's going to bore you to tears. Uh, and there are so many better books out there. And that's why I want to just briefly mention before I start that there's a lot of sources that I've looked at besides Stephen Meyer's god-awful book. So let me just mention that there's a number of places on the web where you can find better information. Uh, Donald Prothero and uh, Nick Matsky and Larry Moran have both written extensive takedowns of this book. And for this book, I also dug around in the scientific literature. This is the, this is the nice thing about being a professor. Creationist says something stupid. You just go to your library, and you've got open access to all this stuff. And you, you find how many times they lied. That wasn't me. OK. So anyway, there's lots of sources that you can go to. And I'll just, I just splash them up there. If anybody wants me to send you the reading list, I can do that later. But let's focus a little bit. The book is monstrous thick because Stephen Meyer is a long-winded philosopher. He's got no background in science at all. He's not a biologist. He's not a paleontologist. He's a, he's an, a, a Christian apologist turned philosopher. And so that's, what, that's what his background. So I don't want to go into everything. So let me just narrow it down to a few claims. And I will try to address these claims in this talk. So here are the three claims I'll look at. Just There's many more, but just these three. These are the fundamental ones. So one claim he makes is that almost all animal phyla arose all at once at the start of the Cambrian with no predecessors, no antecedents in the earlier fossil record. So he says, boom, right there at the Cambrian transition. That's when all these new phyla appeared. He also argues that the period of their emergence was so short that it is not possible for mere Darwinian evolution to have worked so fast. So he's trying to argue that there's got to be something outside of the natural mechanisms that, that we scientists think are pretty, pretty cool and gee whiz. Uh, there's got to be some magic in there. And finally, he repeats at length a claim he made in his earlier book, Signature in the Cell, and that is that natural mechanisms cannot generate new genetic information. Only intelligent things can create new information. Every single one of these claims is trivial, false, absurd on the face of it, and has been thoroughly refuted over and over again in the scientific literature. The scientific literature that Meyer claims to have read and cites in the book, terrible stuff. Anyway, so let's go through these one by one. Let's just focus on that first claim. So he says, almost all animal phyla arose all at once at the start of the Cambrian. And this is actually a figure from the book. You notice the rigorous quality of their illustrator. It's, it's kind of pretty. It's a nice, it looks like a nice rough pencil sketch. But this is what he's got throughout his book. Um, and it's, it's a lie, actually. What he's trying to argue is that 
phyla make discrete kinds. There's no inter, there's no close intermediates between phyla. He's trying to claim that the fossil record before the Cambrian start is completely empty, that all those dotted lines represent hypothetical theoretical organisms. And he's also trying to claim that once they're formed, they, you don't get any transformations. They're all, they're all within these narrow ranges, which to follow the biblical style, I will call kinds rather than phyla. But as I said, this is, this is totally false. This is not true at all. That if you actually look at the geological record, if you go marching through it, what you find is a remarkable transition that lasts for many millions of years. It's not abrupt at all. Well, to any of you who are geologists, you may be saying, yeah, a few million years, that's really fast. Biologists say, no, a few million years, that's, that's, a, that's a good, healthy, long period of time. You can get a lot done in a few million years. So let me just show you some examples here. Um, these are Precambrian fossils. So it's not true that there are no fossils in the Precambrian. If you go to the Precambrian, so before that transition and you rummage around, people have been finding lots of things in, for instance, the Ediacaran period and so forth. And what's illustrated up here is a series of these. So there's, there, there, there are remains of soft-bodied organisms. So they're not really recognizable as modern forms. What you see over there at the top left, for instance, is you often see these kind of disc-shaped things, these things that look like dinner plates that just sort of laid out on the sea floor. Uh, and in B, in the middle there, that's a bunch of fossilized algae. So you've got algae, stripes of algae all over the place that are getting fossilized. Uh, there's some mysterious fossilized animals in the top right. There's some fossilized embryos in E. Uh, a lot of the Precambrian organisms look kind of like this. They're either dinner plates or they look like uh, the fronds of a feather or some sort of pen-like structure that's, that's lying on the seafloor. And then, of course, down here at the bottom right is what you often find at the beginning of the Cambrian is a different kind of fossil. Those are trace fossils, burrows. So before the Cambrian, what you typically had was flat jellyfish-like things that were lying on the surface, or probably some, many of them floating in the sea, uh, and there were no worms. One of the big revolution of the Cambrian was the invention of worms, things that could actually burrow down into the substrate, liberate nutrients, and started churning over a process called bioturbation, a lot of the nutrients that were locked up in the sea floor. So there was a big change going on there. So if you were to walk through the Precambrian strata and walk forward, what you'd find is largely rocks empty of hard-shelled organisms. You'd find occasional traces of soft-bodied organisms. This is exactly what you'd expect if evolution were working, that the first animals would have been gooey, soft, non-skeletonized, small creatures that would have lived on the surface. And then as you get into the Cambrian, what you discover is new forms start to emerge. So let me just show you a little timeline here. Uh, this is the Cambrian in green over there. So you see it's starting about 540 million years ago. And it's going up to about 490 million years. So we're talking about a 50 million year period. This is a 50 million year long explosion, OK? It's kind of, it's, Again, the geologists are saying, yeah, 50 million years, that's pretty quick. But the rest of us are saying, well, oh, no, you know, that's still kind of lingering. Um, <laughs> what you also may see there is that, again, I won't go over the ne details and names, but there's a number of divisions of the Cambrian. So you see these shorter divisions listed over there on the right side of the bar. And there's a bunch of, of hallmarks listed there, uh, things like the emergence of the first trilobites, et cetera that what you see when you actually look at the Cambrian fossil record is a gradual progression. That sounds like evolution to me. It's not abrupt at all. That you, what you start off with is small, soft-bodied things. And then among the first hard-bodied fossils you find are shown here. Uh, this is something called Claudina. And what it is is basically an armored worm. So these were soft-bodied creatures that were secreting uh, a hard shell around their outsides to protect them from predators. 
And we know there were predators, although we have not identified them, because when you look at these fossils, you often find they have little boreholes through there, something drilled through to eat the poor little Claudina organism inside. So that's the level of complexity you have in the Ediacaran, the Precambrian, before the Cambrian. You also see critters like this. This is the stem mollusk Kimberella. Kimberella is kind of cute. It's a little, little tiny creature. It looks a bit like a limpet. Oh yeah, this is Missouri. You guys don't know about these coastal creatures. There's this thing called an ocean. And it has a shore. And there are lots of mollusks there. And for instance, there are these creatures called limpets that have a little flattened cone-shaped shell. And there's a little slug-like beast under it. And it crawls around like a slug. You do have those here in Missouri, right? Yeah, so it's like a shelled slug. That's basically the level of organization we got there. Then what you find is something called the small shelly fossils. It's not like all of a sudden, boom, there's organisms everywhere. What you see at first is these little broken bits of shell. That what's happening is that organisms don't suddenly evolve a complete bodysuit of armor. They evolve it partially. And one example is the Halkiarids, which are shown up there, and that's a terribly blurry, dark picture, I'm sorry. Uh, what it looks like, if you could see it, if it were a little brighter, is uh, it's an elongate creature. No, it's not this big, it's more like this big. Uh, a little elongate creature, at, one, at both ends it has caps, like that limpet shell, like that thing that you see in, in Kimberella. And then in between it's got little shells called sclerites. And usually when these die, they disintegrate because they're soft-bodied, of course. And all you find is the scattered fragments. You find a little limpet-like shell over here. You find this little sliver of a sclerite here. It's scattered throughout. And so what you find in, in this initial layer is lots of things called, it's literally called the small shelly fossils because that's what it is. It's little bits and pieces of an organism that aren't assembled into the whole thing. And then, of course, notice up there, we get finally to trilobites. Trilobites are appearing in the early Cambrian. Uh, they are a remarkably successful species or group of organisms for quite a long time. And uh, most of you have probably heard of the Burgess Shale, right? If you read Stephen Jay Gould's book, you know about this. The stuff in the Burgess Shale, look up there, that's the middle Cambrian. So all the stuff he's describing in there is stuff that was first evolving 30 million years ago. So it's a mistake to look at Burgess Shale and think, oh, well, there's this sudden eruption of new forms there because, no, there were all these predecessors through these previous stages and into the Ediacaran that evolved first. So, it's, so that's one message I want to get across to you. It's not as abrupt as they would like you to think. It's a, it's a real phenomenon where there's, there's this sudden radiation of all kinds of new forms, but it's an, a radiation over tens of millions of years. And it's amazing that people who think the Earth is only 6,000 years old will seriously talk about, oh, well, it was amazingly fast. It was 10 million years ago, 540 million years ago. Oh, yeah, right, okay. This is just a plot. I'm, I'm gonna show you some data from various papers here. Don't worry too much about the details. Uh, what this is, is a plot of the numbers of phyla and the number of classes discovered at different times. And what you should be able to see is it's not sudden. It's not bang, boom, all of the phyla appear all at once. It's a little bit gradual in there. You see a number of them appearing there. Uh, classes emerge even more gradually. That what you've got is this long-term period of cladogenesis, where new species, new forms are emerging. Again, not sudden, not instantaneous. I'm going to show you an even more intimidating figure. Don't be scared. Don't run from the room. It's OK. I'll, I'll guide you through it. Uh, this is a chronogram. And what it is is a, it's a set of data made by analyzing extant species and looking at highly conserved genes, genes that don't change much, that change very slowly, so they provide a good clock looking at times of divergence. And we can put together this nice little pedigree that illustrates the relationships of all the forms over there on the right. So everything from these little flatworm-like things, placozoa, uh, through arthropods, through mollusks, 
starfish, you see echinoderms up there, vertebrates somewhere in there, but who cares, they're boring. Um, and what you see is a tree diagram illustrating when these groups diverge from one another. And what you should be able to see is that, yes, there's the Cambrian, that little C, the green C down there. And you can see that a fair number of them did branch off, that did emerge at about that time. But you can also see that there are many branches after that. It's not like the aliens came and zoom, it all was done. It's a gradual process. And you could also see, if you look to the left, a lot of these forms arose much earlier, deeper in the adiacaran. This is what we can see using molecular biology rather than trying to look for fossils, which are rare and are soft-bodied creatures, et cetera. So we use molecular biology to dissect that out. And what we find is that, for instance, the common ancestor of all animals, the creature that linked, links us to squid, to clams, to insects, to all the forms of animals that are on the planet, lived about 770 million years ago. Cambrian, remember, 540 million years ago. That means there's about 300 million years of molecular evolution before we got this radiation into large-bodied forms at the start of the Cambrian. So bye-bye, Stephen Meyer. You're wrong. Another place where Stephen Meyer is completely wrong, though, is, is there's a problem here. And it's a, it's a recent conceptual problem scientists are learning, too, and we're trying to rethink how we think about things. And this problem is the fact that we're often saddled with Linnaean taxonomy. That what we think of these, we think of these groups as phyla, for instance. Phyla makes sense when you're looking at modern organisms. I mean, clearly, people and cockroaches are very different, except for the Republicans, which represent a transitional <laughs> form. But if we discount those, they're discreetly different, and we're pretty comfortable saying they belong in different phyla. But the problem gets when you go back into the past, you go 540 million years ago, suddenly it gets much more ambiguous. And we have to think in a new way. And let me illustrate that with this little cartoon diagram. So here what we have is phylum A and phylum B. So this could be, for instance, arthropods over there and vertebrates over here. It doesn't matter. This is an abstract exercise. And what you find is there's many branch points. Uh, all the extant species are up at the top there. And you could say, for instance, well, look at the purple line and the red line over there. How evolutionarily related are they? And you can see that to get to the last common ancestor, you have to go way back in this chart, all the way back to the bottom of the graph and then back up. They have a lot of evolutionary distance between those two forms. So we're comfortable. We're, we're saying those are very remote from one another evolutionarily. They're phylogenetically distant. We'll fit them into two different phyla. But now you think about what's going on at the base of the tree. Look down there at the bottom. Uh, there's, I got a blue line coming off there from the phylum A side and the colors aren't showing up very well, but that's supposed to be a green line on the right side over there. Look at those two species. They're actually fairly close to one another, right? They have recently diverged from that branch point down there at the bottom. Those two species are about the same, have about the same phylogenetic relationship to each other as, for instance, the two red species in phylum B. They're about equally remote. Actually, I'd say, looking at that, they're, they're a little closer to each other than those two species that we've grouped into phylum B. So what do we do with those? Do we call those phyla? That makes no sense. Phyla is a Linnaean taxonomic term that was designed to express discrete differences between large groups of organisms. But when you get down at the base of the tree of animal life, you find that they're really, really close and it's not so easy to say, well, that belongs in a different phylum. Modern taxonomists have got a different set of termino terminology that they use nowadays. And so let me just mention this terminology because it actually helps to understand what's going on. We talk about crown groups. So what is a crown group? Well, for instance, for phylum A, we'd look at those three species there. And we'd say, OK, those share characteristics. They belong in the same phylum. They belong in the same crown group, which includes all the species that preceded them 
right up to the last common ancestor. So you see my big oval there. Those are all members of the crown group. And that's a term you'll see bandied around a lot in the evolutionary biology literature now, is talking about crown groups. And similarly, for the other side, we can say there's a crown group B, which includes those extant species and their lost common ancestor and everybody in between. The nice thing about this is now it's set up a distinction. We can talk about our crown groups, and what about those guys down there? We no longer have to shoehorn them into phyla. We call them instead stem groups. And stem groups represent novel forms, novel lineages that don't neatly fit into one of our crown groups, but they're clearly related to them. And by looking at it this way, what we also see is there's something important about those guys down there. Because what they represent now is, now that we're not trying to say, oh, that's that, that uh, blue line over there, we're not trying to say now that's an arthropod. We're saying it's a unique creature of its own. And we can see that it is a transitional form between the last common ancestor and our crown group. By looking at it this way, we can recognize stem groups as different subgroups, ancestral groups of a common set of animals that exhibit transitional characters. And this drives the creationists batshit crazy. They cannot digest this because what it means is now we have a methodological means for isolating and recognizing groups of creatures as specifically transitional forms. And we can actually use analysis of these forms to tease apart, step by step, the process of evolving the crown group. So it's pretty powerful stuff. And there's a huge literature on it. Um, Stephen Meyer does not recognize it. In his book, he gets the definitions of crown group and stem group all wrong. Uh, he insists on calling distant stem group forms as belonging to particular phyla. It's the only way he can generate this illusion that they all belong in one discrete little column of creatures is by ignoring the reality of how science perceives things. He's also ignoring all the evidence. You know, when you look at stem groups, what you find is confusion until you get really deep into it. So this, for example, is these are stem group arthropods. Look at them, they're all over the map. All, there's, there's their pedigrees, they're all related in such and such a way. Uh, there's all these different exotic forms, none of them like anything that lives today. And it would be a huge mistake to say, oh, well, we've got to call that a member of a particular phylum. We've got to call this a shrimp, because it's not a shrimp. And when you recognize that, what you recognize is the truth of the Cambrian explosion, which was there was an increase in the diversity of forms present not necessarily immediately mainlining themselves directly into the phyla that we're familiar with. Okay, so let me just stop there and just summarize that so far what I've told you is no, there were lots of antecedents to the Cambrian organisms, and furthermore, that what we find is transitional forms all over the place. This is one of the exciting things about reading paleontology of the Cambrian, is what you're looking at is just nothing but uh, transitional forms all over the place. They're telling you a lot about how these things, these creatures we love so much, came to be. OK, let me address his second question now. Remember, his second question was this, that the period of emergence was so short that it is not possible for mere Darwinian evolution to have worked so fast. It's impossible for those who evolved so quickly, he would like to say. And there's his typical kind of cartoonish diagram of this whole thing. Um, and what you notice down there at the bottom is his evidence, he just draws all these creatures as straight lines. There's no divergence, no branching. Uh, this would fit perfectly well in the Creation Museum as what they think is going on as well. Although the Creation Museum actually acknowledges more branching than the Discovery Institute does. It's amazing. Anyway, weird stuff. Now, there has been a lot of detailed analyses of the rate of evolution of forms in the Cambrian. And I'm not going to show you all the data because it's boring. Really, seriously, it's boring. It's table after table after table. For instance, what you do is you look at trilobites. And you collect all the trilobites you can. You sample all the trilobites from the Cambrian. 
and then you group them in nice little pedigrees, like I'll show you here. So there's a pedigree of tri trilobites there, a little cladogram illustrating their relationship. And then what you do is you figure out, okay, how long is, uh, how long is a branch? How many years does it take to s produce a new species of trilobite? And this fellow Lieberman has done a number of things like this, and I'm just summarizing his work there, that when he did this, and he actually looked and quantified the rates of speciation, the rates of morphological change in the creatures through the Cambrian, what he found was that their rates were perfectly ordinary. Maybe a little on the high side, but as he says in this quote, it's the same thing we see at many radiations, like after the dinosaurs were wiped out, mammals radiated rapidly. That means they went through a period of accelerated evolution because all these new niches opened up. So the same thing is going on in the Cambrian, that these are creatures who have exploited new environments and they're rapidly speciating, but it's still well within the bounds of what neo-Darwinian theory predicts. So I'm, I'm cutting through a lot of data here. You'll, you'll have to trust me, but go read the paper if you want. Uh, where he documents uh, these measurements. And yeah, it's pretty mundane. That there's nothing unusual about this. Again, remember, the Cambrian was 50 million years long. The periods where most of the rapid evolution occurred were you know, tens of millions of years long. That's a fairly long time. You can get a lot of speciation going on that period of time. The other approach being taken to this is my favorite approach, which is an evo-devo analysis we can ask when did particular molecules that are important in the formation of the body plan arise? So we've got lots of data now on the genes that regulate the form of mice, of echinoderms, of people, of grasshoppers and fruit flies. And we can compare these across these different groups and we can ask you know, relatively when did these arise? When was the earliest? When was the latest? We can sort of do a stepwise dissection of the process. And what we find is, again, that it's, it's nothing extraordinary, in particular because when you start doing that analysis, you discover you're working deep in the, in the Ediacaran. We're looking at the Precambrian eras. We're no longer limited to the Cambrian. Most of the developmental me mechanisms that are so important to us that make us stand up tall and have faces and eyeballs and ears and brains and all this stuff, that evolved in the Precambrian, so in that period from 700 million to 400 million years ago. And what we can do then is we can also dissect it in a stepwise fashion as, fashion as you see here, that early on you had genes that evolved, the Hox genes, that basically partition the body along its length and say, this is the middle, this is, these are the ends. Uh, later you had a set of genes that arise that centralized, that are important in the centralized nervous system and in the gut. So that emerged a little later. So what you start off with is just a basic worm, and then what you've got is a worm with the beginnings of a brain, not much of a brain, but the beginnings of a brain, and a highly specialized gut that can process food in more interesting ways. And then finally at this stage, a little later, you get things like the emergence of photoreceptors. You've got, now you've got a worm with a little bitty brain and eyes and a heart. And we can dissect all these things and see how, how that occurs. And again, uh, the rates of molecular evolution are nothing shocking. This is what we measure and it fits with everything that we see going on right now. Okay, let me get to that last point that Meyer raises. And that is that natural mechanisms cannot generate new genetic information. Only intelligence can do so. And he hammers on this. He thinks this is his infallible argument because if the only way you can get new genes is for intervention by Jesus or aliens or whatever, then case closed. Evolution can't explain it. Uh, he's now going to have to add some other things like that Jesus spent 40 million years walking the earth tweaking every little invertebrate he found, but okay, let's fit that into our new theology. But what I want to say is that's not true. We have lots of mechanisms that generate novelties, and I'm going to show you another one of those intimidating tables. Um, again, ask me for the reference and I can give it to you if you want to look into it in detail. Uh, what this is is illustrating all the molecular mechanisms that we know of that generate new genes, that generate new genes right now that we can observe and measure, that we see in the wild and that we see in the lab. 
And there are things like exon shuffling, that you can take fragments of another gene and splice it into a gene and generate a new form that does something interesting. Um, gene duplication, uh, retroposition, there are genes that just sort of swap tr chunks of DNA around. Uh, I'll jump ahead to the last one, de novo, de novo origination, uh, that you can have junk DNA. Hey, I remember talking about this last year. Where were you guys? Okay, some of you were here, yeah. So there's this, this, this huge volume of junk DNA, and every once in a while, very rarely, a piece of that junk will get incorporated into a, a functioning gene and will be discovered to have some useful properties. Maybe it changes the, the hydrophobicity of the molecule. Maybe it adds a new active site. All kinds of things can happen. And that happens every once in a while. So, you know, we've got all these mechanisms in place. These don't require an intelligent designer. They happen spontaneously. We see them and we measure them. Furthermore, we can document examples of these. So here's this. Again, I'm sure it's a little blurry way back there. Uh, but what this is, is, again, is a catalog of recently innovated genes that have been found. For instance, up there at the top, uh, let's see if I can read that myself. Um, that's Jingwei. Okay, Jingwei is a really cool gene. It's built by splicing together a couple of other fragments of genes, and it builds a whole new gene. It's present in a small number of fruit fly species, and we know that it evolved about two and a half million years ago. So that was before we were playing in the lab, all right? Unless, unless Australopithecus was up to more things than we thought. Anyway, so there's genes like that that we find. There's um, oh, SDIC is up there. That's a really cool gene that, that evolved less than three million years ago. And that's one of those genes that incorporated some random garbage from the junk DNA and acquired a new function that's important in differentiation of molecules. So really, Meyer's argument here is <coughs> it's pretty much untenable. It's pretty much impossible to, to make that argument because we know all these processes and we've documented them and we can bring out genes and show them to you. And we can tell you how that arose within the last few million years. And it was entirely by natural mechanisms as we were illustrated on the previous slide. So I don't know why he persists with this. Maybe it's because he's an idiot. OK, so let me just close out by asking the big question, the one we're all wondering. OK, so the Cambrian transition was real. There really was a period of rapid evolution of new forms roughly 540 million years ago. And you got to ask, what caused it? Now, the Discovery Institute wants you to believe that it was an intelligent designer from somewhere else. Uh, and Meyer, in the last chapter of his book, actually reveals that he thinks it was Jesus, uh, that it was this intelligent designer that came down and tweaked everything. I don't think that's the case. I've got a couple of other alternatives I would present to you. One is this one, that it was the great god Anomalocaris who created life in his own form in the Cambrian. And that is the creature you ought to bow down and worship, is this giant armored arthropod-like, but it's not an arthropod, remember? It's one of the stem groups. Giant arthropod-like creature with these huge grasping organs at the front of its head. Uh, pray to him or you will be damned. So that's one possibility, right? <laughs> Not likely. If you talk to the scientists, though, um, we have been evolving a rather interesting and nuanced understanding of what went on at the beginning of the Cambrian. And unfortunately, it does not fall into, oh, here's the simple answer. Something pushed this button, it happened. Uh, oxygen levels rose up, and that was all it took. It was, that, there's, there's no simple umbrella hypothesis to explain it. So I'm going to show you this lovely diagram that summarizes all of our understanding of the beginnings of the Cambrian. Isn't that cool? What it's telling you is that science is saying there's no simple answers. There's a really complicated answer, and it's a really kind of a cool answer, uh, that at the beginning of the Cambrian, what was happening was a number of changes in the geochemistry. In particular, there was increasing oxygen levels. There were changing sea levels that were uh, flooding plains and creating these nice shallow seas. There was increased erosion, illustrated up there at the top left. So you've got, you've got more matter just flushing down into the seas. So now the seas are full of carbonate. 
and phosphates, cool stuff like that that biological organisms love to use. And what that was then being used is taken advantage of by cells, which were using, for instance, the calcium to build shells, biomineralization. Uh, they were using the phosphates for an increase in nutrient flux. Phosphates are an important uh, factor in uh, building nuclei. That with this flush of water rising up and all these nutrients entering it, that increased the habitable volume. So it's increased the amount of space in which creatures can live and expand and flourish and breed and all that kind of cool stuff. And then what you saw down there's an arrow, there's another thing that happened. At, before the beginning of the Cambrian, some of us bilateral organisms, our worm-like ancestors became worm-like, which meant they could bur burrow, they could burrow down, which allowed the substrate to be oxidized, also liberated nutrients into the water column, which increased the food web complexity, which leads, leads to origin of plankton and leads to an explosion in animal diversity. See, that's the simple answer as far as a scientist is concerned. I mentioned at the very beginning, I showed you um, that my list of references, and one of those references was by Valentine and Irwin, which is a book on, on the Cambrian explosion, which unlike Meyer's book, is actually a very good book. Uh, and I recommend it highly, but don't think it's casual reading, because what you'll discover when you read about the origins of the Cambrian, you often aren't reading much about biology anymore. It's all geochemistry. It shocked me when I started reading this book, and I had to learn new things. I'm 56 years old, aren't I done? So, but it's, it's, it's really an excellent book. But it's, it's telling you that in order to understand what's going on here, you have to have a depth of knowledge. You have to understand many disciplines. You have to integrate them well. You have to correspond and correlate with existing data. That's the only way to build reasonable hypotheses, no matter how complicated they are for complicated phenomena. And the creations just short circuit all that and give you pablum that doesn't tell you anything and in large part is built on, a f on fictions and lies. Okay, I think that's enough for you all to digest. And do I get to have a few minutes to ask questions? I finished early. Yeah. No? No, we don't do Q&A at Skepticon. Sorry, everyone. But you, I mean, you can talk okay. to all of your adoring fans. I could After just, your speech. Okay. I don't. I feel. I feel people. like I'm giving time to Rebecca Watson. Where are you, Rebecca? Yeah, she's she's applauding for me to get off the stage. I guess I will. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And yes, I will be around to have a conversation with any of you. We'll be back at 7, so take a short break. <laughs>